Um, and we're the recording. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the December 8, 2020 Utility Board special meeting by video. Uh, I'm Tim O'Connell and chair of the Utility Board. Uh, in accordance with uh, Governor Inslee's proclamation, we're doing this board meeting by video conferencing using Zoom. Uh, it's live at this point being recorded and will be uploaded to the city's YouTube channel later on in the day. Public Works Director Kittner, uh, Council Member Andrew, and several other staff members are with us this evening. Uh, thank you to those who are listening in and uh, we look forward to moving forward our relatively brief agenda tonight. Um, first off, uh, board members, uh, please be sure that your microphones are turned on for the roll call. So. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you would call the roll. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Chair, Chair O'Connell. Uh, I'm here. Vice Chair DeBoer. I'm here. Board Member Majewski. I'm on board. Good evening. Board Member Marshall. Present. Board Member Stephen Milton. Present. Board Member Thomas. Here. And I show that board member William Bacorny is absent this evening. Very good, thank you. We have, we have a quorum. And so let's move forward, just uh, board members. Again, we have a relatively light agenda, but just in the interest of moving forward smoothly, uh, please do indicate to me if you need to be recognized, uh, use the raise your hand feature, or you can just wave at me on the Zoom, but let's do try to not talk over one another. Uh, we'll make sure everybody has a chance to participate fully and fairly. Uh, first item of business is to approve the minutes of the November 10 meeting. Uh, do I have a motion from any of the board members to approve those minutes? So moved. I believe, who, who was that who made that motion? Was that, that was Brian, uh, board member second. Thomas made the motion. Is there a second? I see board member Milton raising his hand to second. Uh, there's any discussion uh, regarding the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Very good. Uh, so, Adam Clerk, you may record that was unanimous. Um, next item of business uh, we have an update from Public Works Director Kip. Oh, Jason, uh, what's going on? Good evening. Uh, give me a minute here. Oops. Can everyone see my screen? Someone give me a thumbs up if they can see the PowerPoint. Perfect. Excellent. Good evening. Uh, thanks for joining me this evening. I have some staff on the call with us this evening as well. Patrick Masha, our city engineer. Rona Lynn, our utilities engineer. Alan Hunter, our uh, operations utility operations manager, and then uh, Maya Giddings is also on the phone or on the call, who is our CIP project coordinator. Uh, all of them have an instrumental role and a couple of key project updates for you this evening. Uh, but as you said, it is a fairly light evening agenda, so we'll get right into it. So tonight, I'll just quickly go over uh, the booster coronation station project. We've talked about this at the utility board for a handful of years. Uh, we've had some key uh, some key things have taken place on the project, so it's important to give you guys an update on that. And then the updated time frame, obviously, as we move into the next calendar year and the construction schedule. Uh, and then a new project to the, to the board, and I think we've touched on it just briefly, but uh, it's sort of something to uh, whet your appetite with for 2021 uh, with the risk and resiliency project uh, and emergency response plan that we have to complete. So with that, I'll just dive into the booster coronation station. Uh, we'll take down just a brief trip down memory lane for our new board members. Uh, we had a water advisory in 2014 that uh, we all remember like it was yesterday. Uh, it required Department of Health required a long-term action plan to be implemented as part of that response to that water advisory. Uh, we are required to maintain our chlor residual chlorine levels at a higher level uh, now post water advisory than, than before. Uh, with the, the main strategies to avoid our future contamination with maintaining positive pressure at all times, maintaining adequate disinfectant levels, 
and then prevent our cross connections. All three of those uh, key elements have been updated and refined pretty substantially as post-boil post water advisory. The important piece out of this is uh, following that action plan, the city proceeded to design and construction of a permanent uh, booster chlorination station. Again, we talked about this with the utility board and the council uh, leading up to the 2019 and 2020 capital budget. Um, and I'll get into some of that background in just a second. This is the image that we use uh, that Confluence developed um, that many of our community members are familiar with in terms of our action plan as part of our water advisory. Um, when we first started the event uh, post 2014, everything on this list was black. And as we started checking through things, uh, they moved to green meaning that we had accomplished them. This was last updated in February of 2018 because we actually submitted a final report to the Department of Health and actually moved out of that action plan and are no longer, uh, no longer having to give them regular updates on this progress because we've completed the work. Um, but it's just a helpful reminder of all the different things that we had to address as part of that action plan. The last sort of standing item was this booster coronation station. Uh, so with that, we were required to have an on-the-shelf construction ready design um, that we worked with HDR Engineering to design uh, in 2018. They completed it uh, in late December, uh, but our water system is fairly complex. And what I mean by that, and uh, we'll talk about it in just a second too, is when we want to turn the entire island mustard, a mustard yellow is what Council Member Grouse remembered that conversation about, uh, in order to turn the entire island mustard and increase residual chlorine throughout the entire distribution system, there's some pretty significant pipe changes that have to take place to actually get that configuration to work accordingly. Uh, that's due to the system comp complexity. And so um, what we recognized with HDR is there were some shortfalls in their design. And so we actually went and had the project value engineering complete on the project. Uh, I think it's important to note that post water advisory, our staff has nearly tripled uh, their data collection, which allows us the opportunity to see the distribution system with some different types of data uh, to illustrate the need for this system. Again, our goal is to maintain that 0.6 milligrams per liter and 95% of our samples collected uh, throughout the distribution system. So with that data collection, uh, this is our GIS team created this graphic. Uh, we've seen this, you guys have seen this before, I believe, many of you have. It just illustrates some of the challenges we have with maintaining that uh, residual chlorine level uh, at 95% of our system or more. Uh, and so it, this is a simple heat map based off that data collection that illustrates some of our problem areas throughout a distribution system. We've now used this to help obviously prioritize the capital investment. This, this helps us prioritize our daily, daily operations and um, just how we're actually monitoring our system. Again, this is the famous graphic uh, on the left is uh, our distribution system has three, three different supply zones. Uh, in order to turn that entire island yellow or mustard color, uh, some different pipe configurations have to be completed uh, to turn it mustard. Again, the, the map on the right is a different heat map iteration that shows some of our more challenging areas to maintain that residual chlorine throughout our distribution system. We also work with Confluence to identify uh, what scenarios we would use a booster station, uh, a booster disinfectant station in our uh, operations. And that includes uh, low chlorine residual within the SPU supply line, uh, low residual numbers exiting our reservoirs, uh, low chlorine within the distribution system, uh, depending on, we have that come up from time to time, uh, a pressure loss event or a water quality event or uh, positive coliform. Uh, so these are the five scenarios that have been identified with, you know, SOPs in terms of how we would actually implement the system uh, once, it's, once it's necessary and operational. As I mentioned, HDR completed the design in December of 18. However, there were some flaws uh, or some concerns that were raised in their designs. We, we hired Corello engineers to perform a, a value engineering of it, and they actually provided some uh, revised recommendations to the engineering drawings. Uh, they have been working on that throughout the course of this last year. It was slightly delayed because of the, the staff changeover we have within our department between our utility operation manager and our assistant city engineer that left the organization. 
Uh, but our team has picked this back up and they're working with Corillo to finalize the design. Uh, and we anticipate going into construction next year. Um, with that, there's always some changes that go along with uh, that design. And again, Rona, Alan, and Maya are on the phone or the call tonight if we have some specific questions about some of these additional tasks that were added to the design. Um, but it's, as I said, it's, it's, our system is complex. And so we had, to, uh, we had to modify the design in order to turn the entire island mustard. Uh, I think one of the key points to illustrate is Utility Water may remember early in the conversation with the water advisory that we talked about mixing our tanks, right? We get stratification with our tanks at times. And there was, there was some uncertainty on whether or not we actually needed to add mixers to our tank. I think through the data analysis and the engineering perform, performed by Corello, we do know now that we have to add not only the booster station to our operation, but we also have to add mixers to our tanks to keep that chlorine from stratifying within the reservoirs. Again, this is all being finished in our design now uh, with the anticipation of going into construction next year. So here's your updated time frame. Again, we're at 50% design now. We anticipate finishing in March of 2021, uh, bidding shortly behind it, and then construction beginning in 2021. Uh, so uh, slightly, slightly delayed uh, due to some different complexities. Again, uh, staff changes, value engineering, revised design, COVID, um, but we've picked this project back up. It's an important one for us to get implemented in the next year, uh, and we're on, we're on target to do that. So before I move on to the next project, I thought I would pause here uh, because we have talked about this project a handful of times. Um, there are some slight iterations with it, but it's always a good opportunity to ask the utility board for questions or concerns. And uh, I see board member Thomas has a question. Good use of the raise hand function, Ryan. Thank you. Uh, I try to follow instructions as best I can. Uh, Jason, uh, so for the, the SIP that's contemplated, that's for the chlorination booster and the related uh, activities, right? That's not the uh, reconfiguration of some of the pipes to boost throughout the system to turn everything mustered by uh, beginning in 2021. Is that correct? No, it is a combination. So the new design includes that reconfiguration of the pipes to actually accomplish that goal and task. So it's uh, the both. These are being tied together, correct? Okay, so so is uh, so can you give us kind of a a hint of what the 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 pipe reconfigurations would entail? Uh, um, you've got a couple areas obviously that were problematic. I see one along East Mercer Way and one up near the Shore Club, where there's a red dot there that was there every month for 12 months. Um, uh, can you kind of give us a just a? I know you're not done and you're still there. The engineers are still working, but do we kind of know the scope of what's contemplated? We do know the scope and I see Rona popped up on the screen. It's, it's not, the pipe reconfiguration is not necessarily out towards, uh, you know, those red areas that are on the map. They're actually more localized at the reservoir facility and how the pipes, the inlets and outlets come in and out of the reservoir facility. Um, Rona or Alan, if you guys want to talk further to that, in terms of what specific pipes or size or diameter or age condition things like that go right ahead but so the um, booster coordination system would be at the reservoir pumps pump station site um, the pipe re reconfigurations would take place in few places the two would be just right outside the reservoir on 89th at the intersection of 43rd and Southeast 44th, um, we will actually be abandoning a stretch of water main from uh, that intersection northeast corner of reservoir side uh, all the way down to East Mercer Way. Uh, we will abandon that uh, one um, 12 inch main. Um, then there will be some reconfiguration just east of the um, pipe coming into uh, between the two tanks. Um, we will mainly to combine the um, incoming supply line into one into um, the pump station. And then um, 
including other reconfiguration in the um, pump uh, in the pump station. When this project is done, it will be one line coming in. It, the water will go through uh, both tanks, and it will be coordinated. Then it will go through the um, the pumps, and it will be um, well. It will go out west of the uh, pump station, and it will be also going out east. There will be one um, supply line used to come down East Mercer Way uh, to the reservoir. Um, after this project, it will be reverse the flow. And the whole purpose is to, uh, like Jason say, that we'll be able to distribute the water or coordinate it throughout the entire island. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I don't know. Alan, do you have anything to add? Um, no, pretty much you've got covered as which we're, we're running water through the reservoir tanks uh, so we can get the mixing going as well. Uh, and we don't have a stratification, so everything does get mixed evenly and spread out evenly through the distribution system. That's a good, that's a good point. That's one of the key pieces of this, this design is to make sure that we are dosing in the tanks and not directly into a pipe. It's a lot easier to... Uh, make sure that the blend ratio is accurate and consistent and we can monitor a lot more effectively than doing a straight injection to a pipe. So that was a consideration that we've actually added into this design process. Great. Board member Majeski, I see you've got a question. Yeah, I do. So um, I'm curious, how is the chlorine lost that makes uh, the Shore Club and it looks like a West Seattle or East Seattle difficult? So a number of a number of different things. Uh, one, it could be pipe age, water bulk water turnover. There could be uh, biofilm that actually de degrades the chlorine level in in the pipe. So it could be a handful of different things. Uh, it could just be a low use area. Uh, oftentimes, you saw on the map that we showed earlier, we have some temperature changes, uh, and in November our temperatures tend to drop, and so our chlorine residual tends to drop along with it as well. So uh, it has to do with a handful of different. Uh, elements, but um, I can tell you it's pretty, our team will be pretty consistent. In fact, they'll get a low chlorine alarm that goes off and they're like, oh yeah, that's, you know, this location, it's, it's, they've got them dialed in now uh, because of some of those other conditions. So what I'll say to that though, is that does feed into our capital replacement program, right? So we evaluate our substandard or water main replacement program with a number of different factors, including uh, pipe age, condition, history of mainline breaks, um, and then water quality has been added to that component as a metric to be scored out with our water main replacements so that we can start prioritizing those areas that have that known deficiency throughout our system. Thanks. I, I have two different questions. I see no other board members, so I'll, I'll start with one that's really a follow-up to the discussion uh, that Rana and, and Alan had. Are any of the water main replacements that are part of this project going to uh, have traffic impacts? Are we going to be uh, disrupting streets and, and whatnot? Rona? Um, I will compare to the other water system improvement project. I would say the impact to traffic on this project would be very minimum. Um, because they're not really spread out. You know, um, what I can think of, it's mostly would be, well, I shouldn't say that, but they're, they're kind of uh, localized, you know? So um, I don't imagine they will have large traffic impact. So I think that you'll have, they'll definitely have some localized impacts. Uh, during the construction period, um, but given the vicinity and on a, it's on a main arterial, uh, we'll, we'll do our best to uh, plan our outages and notify the neighborhood and the traffic impacts and do what we can just like we would with any other construction project. But as far as the pipe replacement goes, it, it really is pretty consistent with our other construction projects that we do every single year. Um, and our notification and information to the community would be uh, something that we've used similarly in the past. Uh, if no other board member has a question, I don't see any other hands raised. I, uh, something 
that you said in the course of your presentation, Jason, uh, and that was that the work that HD engineering did in 2016 was deficient. Um, and, you know, I, we, we, we've been talking about this for long enough. Uh, maybe we've talked about that issue before, but if we had, I, I'd forgotten it. And since we're far enough along in this project that, um, you know, we've entered the stage of, that every project goes through of searching for someone to blame. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm curious uh, if, if the HD engineering work was deficient, did that slow this project down any? And, uh, you know, what have they done about the deficiency in their work? So, uh, the short answer that I would give is yes, I think it did slow our project down. Um, they, we did go back to HDR and had them uh, retool the design a handful of times, but I will tell you, no one knows our system the way, sorry, my kids are in the background yelling if you can hear them, I apologize. Uh, the, no one knows our system and how to operate our system like us, right? It's, we, our operator is the one who knows the system intimately. And anytime you hire a consultant on the outside to come in and look at the system, it, it, it can be challenging to, you know, to understand it fully. And so um, I think at the end of the day, we came to the, the decision that they weren't fully understanding our system and we needed to get the second opinion on how it actually worked. I will say whether one of the other pieces to it is we also want it to be right sized. We didn't want this huge monstrosity of a booster coordination station. We needed it to fit at the reservoir and function within the right means. And so by going through the value engineering process, it's allowed us to right size this, this system for the distribution operation. And so I think it's a combination of things. Um, I wouldn't say HDR is to fully blame for this project, right? There's, we have our own challenges along the way with staffing and COVID and non-COVID and just, you know, things like that. But um, I'm certainly pleased with Corolo being involved in this process and yeah, our team is working closely with them to finalize this design and get it off and running. Um, so. Okay. Any other member of the board have any questions for Jason about that portion? George. I saw that the construction will start in, in the summer of 2021. How long will the construction last? Um, Yes, um, Corolla estimated um, 18 months total for the project, um, eight months for design and 10 months for a construction. So it'll go into 2022 then, right? It, it will, yes. <clears throat> Any other questions? Seeing no hands. Uh, oh, Steve, just yeah. as a just to, just so we've got it as a part of this conversation. What what was the budget line item again? Should have had um, that. With, so yeah. you're asking about the CIP budget or the cost estimate right now? What do we budget in 2021 for the construct for the project? Just yes, um, we have um, 2021. It's mostly for design. Um, but because that what I mean abandonment, so I think we have allocated money for construction in 2021 and 2022. So together, the total budget uh, for construction is um, 20, 20, sorry, 2,350,000. 2, and uh, plus contingency of 250. Okay, um, we are at the 50% design. Do you, so I should give you the cost estimate now? Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. Yeah, if you have it. Yeah, we have 50% um, construction estimate at 2,264,000. It's coming in, coming in pretty close, good. Pretty close. <laughs> Very good. So our plan will be 
we'll finish the design uh, and then we'll have an updated engineer estimate. We'd actually go out to bid for this project and then uh, we'd come back to the council for authorization to award the project. And at that point in time, obviously once we get the bids back, we'll know if an appropriation is necessary or if we budgeted, you know, right okay. on. So there's still a lot of work to do between 50% and 100%. Uh, and those numbers will change slightly through those different decisions that are made along the way. But uh, this project is off and running in the right direction and it's, it's, it's good. So we'll come back to the board with an update. Very good. We'll look forward to that. We've been, we've been talking about this coronation station for many years. It'll be good to see it uh, actually, I mean, being to the point of being shovel ready. Um, Jason, is there anything else uh, as part of your update? Yep, so I'm gonna switch now since we've talked about the booster station so everyone can see my screen again, correct? Looking for a thumbs up, perfect. So we will go to, if I can get my screen to roll, there we go. So the risk and resiliency assessment and the emergency response plan, this is just a couple slides. Uh, again, so we're required uh, as part of the Water Infrastructure Act uh, and building one of the 2002 Safe Drinking Water Act to conduct a risk and resiliency assessment uh, for our water system and then prepare a uh, emergency response plan. Um, we have to complete these plans and then self-certify with the EPA that, uh, that it complies um, with America's Water Infrastructure Act. So once it's completed, we have to update it every five years. So recall on the water system plan, we update that every five years as well. Uh, and so it's likely that these two moving forward will be packaged together. Um, but for now, we, we have to do uh, these two pieces independently. So there's a couple different deadlines for each of them. So the risk and resiliency assessment, uh, again, the deadline is due in June 30th of 2021. And the emergency response plan is the end of 2021. Uh, we have already solicited an RFQ. We've gone out uh, for an RFQ to hire a consultant to help with this process. Uh, and have a consultant on board. Um, actually, we're kicking off the, I believe the kickoff meeting is maybe perhaps tomorrow, if not tomorrow, then the following day. So uh, this, this work is churning. Uh, so just a high level view of the scope for both of them. So the risk and resiliency assessment is obviously characterizing assets and threats. That does include cybersecurity stuff. Uh, analyze those consequences and any uh, threats we may have and then manage that risk and resilience. So oftentimes that'll, that'll lead to a list of projects that we may need to accomplish uh, to improve our utility. So uh, bringing this to the board's attention now because it's likely that as we bring this stuff back, there's gonna be some things that we're gonna have to start including in our next round of capital development and, and work that uh, along with some of the other items on our work plan. Uh, and then the emergency response plan, again, it's to inc incorporate those new hazards and risks mitigation activities, and then a big component of it is obviously to train our staff on the emergency response plan. Uh, I will tell you, one of the great things about Mercer Island is uh, we have an emergency response team and we, we train staff and volunteers to help out because we are an island community. Uh, and this is an important piece because if something does happen, uh, our volunteers and staff that are on the island are gonna have to run our emergency operations uh, during a catastrophic event. So that's a huge component of uh, this plan that is included in the scope of work. So that is just a real high level of those two projects. Again, I wanted to bring them up. Uh, it's not something that uh, we necessarily wanted to do, <laughs> but uh, we have some pretty significant deadlines to get uh, moving on. Uh, the work's underway. And like I said, it's likely that we will be coming back to the utility board uh, Probably, I'm, I believe I have, when we look at the work plan, I mean, I believe I identified it for the spring uh, because the risk and resiliency assessment has to be completed by June 30th uh, of 2021. So trying to get this in front of the board in early spring to talk about it. And with that, I will stop sharing and take any questions. Well, I, I, I don't see any board member. Well, Tom, I'll, I'll recognize you. Uh, just a quick question, Jason. Who's the consultant that you've engaged? So we went through uh, the RFQ process. I think I believe we interviewed three or four firms, and we are using Corolla for this work. Thanks. So, Jason, I, I'll ask a question since uh, the 
your slides use the terms that you need to assess uh, threats and hazards. And I assume you use two different words because they have two different meanings. What what really are the the issues? What are what are the things that you are supposed to be assessing our system for? You know the the the, the danger that they might pose. So it could be so. Uh, uh, hazard could be a natural hazard, like a catastrophic event. Most likely for us would be obviously an earthquake and what impacts would that have on our uh, water utility system? How would we handle it? How do we respond in an emergency? Um, threats could be uh, something as cybersecurity. Uh, it could be uh, other type of uh, localized threats with obviously someone tampering with your water system, what some of the other utilities have had to deal with in the past. So it's, it's evaluating those types of uh, components to the water system and making sure that we have uh, protocols in place uh, and we have planned to address those those scenarios. Well, I guess where I was, what I was trying to figure out is, I mean, this, this is all resulting from a federal statute. Does the statute identify with any more specificity than that what the threats you're supposed to be looking at, what the hazards you're supposed to be looking at, what they are? I mean, because otherwise, you know, it's just imagination of man knows no bounds and we can all start thinking of things that might be threats or hazards. Yes, no, there, there, is, a, there is a set of criteria identified in the statute and there's a, there's a manual that goes along with it. Uh, I don't have it all memorized, so I can't repeat all of them off the top of my head, but yeah, so there is very specific specifications that we have to meet in terms of our assessment. The consultant firm that we've hired has done these for other jurisdictions, so I will also say, uh, the timing for when they have to be completed depends on your size of jurisdiction in which your system supports. And so we are a smaller organization, so we didn't have to finish ours as quickly as some of our larger neighbors like Seattle and Bellevue. So uh, we have the luxury of having a consultant who has gone through this with others and who have gone through the certification process to make sure that the criteria that they're using to assess our system matches what will get us through that certification process. There, there are times when it's to the advantage to not be first. Get it. Absolutely. <laughs> Steve. Just then following up on that, are, are you able to uh, reach out to some of your peers at those organizations and, and uh, share some of those types, some of those uh, reports and ERPs, et cetera? Oh, yeah, so you absolutely. Can crib so off their notes. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the, uh, the, one of the unfortunate uh, pieces of the COVID responses right before Right, the week that COVID hit where everything sort of shut down, SP was actually hold, hosting like a two hour, hey, come talk to us about what we learned and what we didn't learn and uh, what you need to do for your assessment. And so uh, they haven't, I believe they rescheduled it, Rona, I, I believe they rescheduled it, you participated in it if I recall correctly, but uh, we are definitely reaching out to our peers and communicating with them. Rona shaking her head, yes, that she participated. Yes, I do. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure it was a fascinating Zoom call. <laughs> and, I, and I'm sure one of the risks you'll be assessing are the, the topic we discussed a couple of meetings ago, the, uh, the risk of the buildup of explosive sewer gas. <laughs> Jason, that, that one has stuck with me. Uh, you know, I've been on the board for many years, and it was only three months ago I heard about that risk. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I am approaching all of the manholes on the island with uh, more respect than I previously had. So. As you should. It's, uh, you know, it'll be a fast, I can't wait to do the tour with you all so that we can uh, show you some of these very confined spaces that our team gets in and out of on a daily basis and sometimes often late at night when it's really, really dark out. Uh, I believe Councilman Randall's actually visited a few of these herself. Uh, I, was, I was just getting ready to unmute and say it's <laughs> definitely worth the price of admission, <laughs> which was free, but um, no, it's a good, it's but a don't, good tour. Don't be I mean, your way around. Don't be feeling your way around in a dark sewer with a match is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, but it, I mean, it is really educational in terms of the difficulty of access to some of these pump stations and, um, you know, some of the, I mean, we hiked overland like a third of a mile down private driveways and across lawns to get to one of them. And it, um, yeah, it's pretty dramatic. I, I agree. Any, 
any other questions for Jason or anyone else from staff about the, this project? Seeing no hands, I will express the board's appreciation. We look forward to following up on this over the course of 2021. Uh, which brings us, I think, to our third item on uh, business, which is to review the uh, work plan for the utility board for 2021. Looking, looking for a thumbs up that you can see the Excel spread. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so this is this is a very rough. Uh, what do you have in front of you? What I will have you note is the dates for the utility board meetings next year. Uh, with those, we will get a calendar notice out to all of you so you can get those on your calendar. Uh, but I'll just sort of walk through. We have some open dates and then we, I definitely want to talk about the uh, utility tour as well. So, because I actually think it might be worthwhile to do, instead of trying to find a date that works for everybody, I think we should just plan on a date and maybe we do a special meeting that month to do a utility tour and we just make an afternoon of it instead. So. Um, but just real quickly, so January we'll have the adopt the work plan. We'll probably also do a city update in terms of the budget's been adopted, uh, sort of the next steps. We'll talk about the work plan for the department and sort of what's in what's on tap. I think it's uh, a good time to also uh, look to the year ahead. So we have the, the meter replacement project, which we've been talking about. Um, so that'll be scheduled for February. We have the skater project and those sewer gases. Uh, the, the sewer construction timing coming back in March. Uh, in April, I've got our NPDES annual report. I think it would be, we have to, we have to report back to the Department of Ecology every single year. And I think it would be a good opportunity to bring back uh, that report to this utility board and talk about uh, some of the metrics associated with it on our stormwater system. And then we also have, uh, as you saw through the budget process, there's a sustainability analyst position that's been added to the Public Works Department. Uh, and there's a work plan that's going to go along with that sustainability position. So I think it's important to come back to the board, talk about that work plan, how it impacts utilities, uh, and some of the different specific components that the sustainability position will be working on with the utilities. Uh, in May, we've got an update on what you heard tonight, the risk and resiliency and the emergency response plan. June, we'll talk about, we'll do the board elections. And then uh, by that time, we'll have the booster station should be designed. Uh, I'm getting ready to go to the council for the authorization to do, award the project. So we'll provide that update and we'll have update engineer costs at that point in time and bids. Uh, in July, I've got just general CIP project updates. So there is a lot going on in public works uh, and utilities this next year. So that's a good time to get out and see uh, some of the projects that might be, that might be a meeting where we do the tour. It's normally pretty nice out uh, in July. We have some good sunlight and evening hours. Uh, so that might be one that we possibly go out and just do the site visits um, and see some of the utilities on that day. Bring our, bring our shoes and long, long pants and go out and, and do some site visits. Mm -hmm. August, we traditionally have a recess. And then we come back in September and October, we dive right into uh, rates for the utilities. I've got the Recology Annual Report scheduled for October. And then November is blank. I fully expect that something's going to come up next year uh, that we will fill that blank with. Uh, but for now, I've left it blank to allow some flexibility throughout uh, the work plan. This is a draft work plan. I'm open to any ideas or conversations that the utility wants to talk about. Um, but it was a it was a starting point for what look what next year looks like. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a question. Um, is that, are those dates, are we back to our regular second Tuesday or is that uh, bouncing around? I believe that's back to our second Tuesday. I went through the calendar. If I have a typo in there, please let me know, but I try to get us back on the second Tuesday of the month. Very good. Thank you. Board members, uh, open it up for discussion. Is there anything any topic that's within our purview that you think needs to be addressed that uh, is is not on Jason's uh, suggested work plan? Brian, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I just think as we get uh, 
wishful thinking, but as we get towards the end of COVID, it might be good to have a discussion with you from your perspective and other folks from staff about how the city managed through it, what things did we learn? Not that uh, we need to prepare for another round, I'm not talking about that, but just have a, have a conversation about what transpired, what, what got pushed, what didn't, kind of um, a, a debrief about getting through that from the city's perspective and its effect on utilities. So, so assuming that Brian hasn't jinxed us by, by saying that he thinks the COVID will be in the rear view mirror at some juncture, I think that's an excellent topic. Anybody else? That's a good point. I'll just, I'll add a little piece into that. And that's, you know, one of the pieces we talked tonight about the booster chlorination station, sorry. Uh, one of the pieces we talked about tonight was the booster coronation station and one of the key components of that action plan was to prevent cross connections and so uh, normally through our cross connection program we are pretty regimented in terms of you know you get x number of notices uh, and penalties and then at some point we cut your water service if you have not complied <laughs> with um, our code requirements we didn't do that this year we have not cut water to uh, those who have not met their cross connection compliance uh, we continue to stay in close contact with the state over this uh, and we're working with the customers as best as possible but that is definitely something that came as a result of covid uh, because obviously having running water and washing your hands is so important uh, through this through this emergency so uh, that's a def that's definitely something we can talk about next year is you know one of these uh, meetings for sure great thanks Tom you brought it up, Jason. Have you, are you seeing um, non-payment increase due to the to the pandemic? So I think early on in the pandemic, uh, talking with utility billing, it was we. I mean, we always have our typical non. I mean, we have our some of our routine customers that are non-payment or late, uh, and that was pretty consistent early on. I think uh, what they will say now is now that we're further into the pandemic and some of the impacts have been larger and longer than maybe we all anticipated to begin with, we are seeing an, an uptick in some, uh, you know, missed payments or uh, what have you. Um, so the short answer is yes. I couldn't give you the number because I don't have it tip of my tip of my tongue, but they have seen an increase in talking with them. Thanks. Hey, hey Jason, this is Lisa. Um, you know, I think some of the other utilities that the you know, publicly owned, I mean, I mean, publicly traded sort of PSE have, you know, low income or hardship assistance programs. Has that ever been considered in the city for the city utilities? Yeah, so or I do, yeah, do so, we have one and I'm not aware of it? <laughs> yeah, so we, we have one. Uh, we do have one. And then we obviously work with our YFS department to help, you know, provide resources when, when it's appropriate. Um, we, you know, early in the early in the pandemic, I remember we we looked at it, but it was it was already structured in a way that it was still applicable and wasn't wasn't changed. It's something that we can certainly go back and look at it again since this this pandemic has lasted longer than we I mean we all hoped. Um, so um, it's a good it's a good question to ask and something that I can follow up with our team on for sure. Thanks. Any other questions or comments regarding the uh, work plan for next year? Seeing none, hearing none, uh, I'll express my appreciation again, Jason, for your work on that. I think that's a pretty good start for next year. Is there any other new business to be brought before the board? Hearing none, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. I'll move. I saw Board Member Marshall make that motion. Second? Seconded. Steve, thank you. Mr. Board Member Milton seconded. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Passed unanimously. Board members, I remind you to stay on camera until the uh, recording is stopped. Uh, thank you. If, as uh, On behalf of the entire board, I hope everybody has a very happy holiday season. You too. See you next year. Thanks, Absolutely. you too. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.